Now that I've given you an overview of Congress and how they pass laws, it is important that I discuss what happens after those laws are passed. So now on to Article 2 of the Constitution. It's quite a broad article when it comes to the entire executive branch, and its power has expanded over time. But there are essential roles it plays in terms of putting laws into effect, otherwise known as implementing them, and enforcing the laws. At the top of the executive branch is the president. As of 2018, our president is Donald Trump. It's essential to understand that we don't directly vote for the president as we do for our Congress members. The winner of the Electoral College wins the presidency. In the most recent election, the winner of the popular vote did not win the Electoral College and thus did not become president. Regardless, once a president is elected, he serves a four-year term. He can serve up to two terms. If he dies, resigns, or is removed, the vice president will become president. This has happened multiple times in history due to death and once due to resignation, Richard Nixon. Despite President Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton being impeached, neither were convicted by the Senate and removed from office. The vice president often has certain issues that he focuses on, but the Constitution does not explicitly give him any direction on what he must do. This is in contrast to the roles of the president. The Constitution explicitly assigns the president the power to sign or veto legislation, as previously mentioned. It also gives him the role of commander of the armed forces. Some of the president's roles aren't as clearly defined in the Constitution, but can be broken up into multiple categories. For example, as head of state, the president is the face of America. As the highest elected leader in the land, he is considered the head of his political party. The president is also tasked with keeping the economy strong and passing other laws through influencing Congress as to what his policy goals are. In fact, per the Constitution, he also addresses Congress yearly about the state of the country in a State of the Union address. He also does things such as grants pardons to those who had been convicted of a crime and receive representatives of foreign nations called ambassadors. His appointment power is particularly important because he is able to appoint judges to lifetime positions on the federal courts, including the Supreme Court, who, as we will discover, have a large role in shaping policy through interpreting the laws. He also appoints a cabinet of advisors on which he relies for advice on certain issues. These advisors serve as the heads of the executive departments. These departments have the immense responsibility of carrying out the law and enforcing it. The Constitution does not give a specific number of executive departments the president must have, nor does it discuss how rules and regulations are made. However, executive departments control the day-to-day -day functioning of the government. The executive departments employ by far the most federal employees of any branch of government. Technically, every member of the military is an executive branch employee under the Department of Defense. The number of departments has increased over time to meet the changing needs of the country. There are currently 15 departments dealing with a range of topics from defense to energy to education. The Department of Homeland Security is the newest addition, having been added in 2002 in response to the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. As noted in a previous slide, the executive departments are run by secretaries. These secretaries are appointed by the president to oversee the departments who are staffed by federal employees. These secretaries are meant to have some content experience on the subject of their particular department. Along with other advisors, they are essential for advising the president on the day-to-day -day workings of the government. Also, as previously mentioned, the executive departments have to deal with the incredibly complicated process of carrying out the laws, which may be very broad or difficult to implement, put into practice. Once laws are carried out, it is up to the department or agency to make sure that companies, organizations, and the government itself is not breaking the rules outlined in the regulations. It is also important that the department make sure that those affected by the new legislation are aware of the changes so that they don't unknowingly violate the law or fail to take advantage of a federal program. While on the last slide I used the word agency in addition to department, the government also has agencies that are still public but run more independently than executive departments. 
They tend to still be run by political appointees, but the president often has less oversight on them. It does, however, depend on the agency. For our purposes, it's important to know that there is more to the executive branch than what exists within the executive departments, but I'm not going to further differentiate between departments and agencies at this time. For example, they are all subject to judicial oversight, as is every other part of government for that matter.